Welcome to the VR and Youth Rehabilitation Research and Training Center webinar, Customized Employment and Overview. Next slide. Um, just quickly, I'm Laura Owens. I work for Transcend, and we are going to talk about customized employment. But before we begin, I want to talk a little bit about who the Rehabilitation Research and Training Center is. Um, this, this center addresses the gaps between knowledge and practice to improve employment outcomes for youth and young adults with disabilities, specifically looking at vocational rehabilitation practices. Um, our charge is to investigate problems, develop solutions, and design strategies through translating research into usable practices. And on this slide, slide 13, you'll see a link to our website that has um, briefs and articles and a variety of information for you to, to research. Slide 14. Today's learning objectives are to understand the essential elements of customized employment, to identify customized employment strategies, and to recognize the critical role of vocational rehabilitation services to support both the job seeker and the business. Slide 15. So um, ODEP, the Office of Disability Employment Policy, uh, defines customized employment um, in these ways. Um, it's a flexible process designed to personalize the employment relationship between a job candidate and an employer in a way that meets the needs of both the job candidate and employer. And customized employment is based on individuals matched between their strengths, conditions, and interests of the job candidates and the identified business needs of an employer. Slide 16. So one thing that um, I wanted to just make sure that people know is we have supported employment, and supported employment is in the law. Um, customized employment strategies are now really what we need to be focusing on to ensure that people with the most significant disabilities are able to obtain and maintain employment. So customized employment should not be viewed as the new model for job seekers with disabilities, but should really be looked at as a way to expand what we already know that's a universally accepted practice that recognizes the power of an individual's community and promoting those relationships in the community. Customized employment strategies give the power back to individuals to their families, to employers, and all the community stakeholders, fostering flexibility, individuality, um, the unique strengths and desires, and those partnerships with the local community. Um, that's really important um, for what we're going to be talking about moving forward. Slide 17. So here are some of the basics of customized employment. The first um, is really important, and that's the presumption of employment. And what that means is that there's no job readiness, that we don't have this idea that people with disabilities have to be ready for the workplace or have to be ready to be able to obtain a job in the community, that you become ready by working in the community, um, by being part of a business. So the idea that everybody is ready regardless of the severity of their disability is something that's really important in customized employment. And then the other is the idea of realistic, that we don't, we don't play the reality police in customized employment, that if somebody is interested in a particular industry or they're interested in a particular area, um, it's our job as employment consultants or transition teachers to figure out why they're interested in that area, to identify businesses where they might be able to try out different types of job tasks, to see if they're really interested in, in doing something like that. One of my favorite examples of this is um, I had a young man who wanted to be President of the United States. And that's sometimes, you know, a hard job to, to take. And he decided that that's really what he wanted to do. Um, as we did the discovery process and got to know him and figured out what his interests really were, it turned out that he had a favorite uncle who was running for alderman. And he was going out and he was canvassing neighborhoods and talking to the community about voting for his uncle 
who was running for alderman. And in his mind, that was like running for president. And so it really wasn't being president. It was politics and working in that kind of an industry. Um, the long story short is his uncle won, thankfully, and um, Marcus was able to um, secure an internship for the summer working for his uncle as an alderman. And 30 years later, he is still working as an administrative assistant for the subsequent aldermen who have um, since been elected. Customized Employment Basics also looks at the individualized relationships between the job seeker and the employer. So it's not so much about us as professionals, but more about the job seeker and what their talents and interests and passions are and the needs of the business. And we are just sort of the conduit that kind of makes those connections con can work. The primary components of customized employment process is that there is no traditional assessment. Um, that we usually traditional assessments that we do with individuals with disabilities are there to eliminate people from the labor force. And so customized employment really looks at more of a discovery or a job seeker exploration process. And that's really the foundation of getting to know that person. From there, we develop an individualized profile, or what we call that trans on a positive personal profile that highlights a person's assets and strengths and abilities. And then finally, the negotiation, customization, or under the ADA, reassignment of tasks that focus on the strengths and assets of the job seeker. So those are the three primary components that we'll be talking about for the rest of this webinar. Slide 18. So um, the National TA Centers, WinTAC and YTAC, partnered with Griffin Hammes, Transcend, Mark Golden Associates, and Virginia Commonwealth University to develop a document with the essential elements in response to vocational rehabilitation agencies and other workforce development systems to better achieve uh, competitive integrated employment for individuals with disabilities. So this document discovered um, quite a few essential elements. I'm not going to address all of them, but I'm going to address the key essential elements that really pertain to kind of an overview of customized employment. So the first one is negotiation of job duties. Under customized employment, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, job duties are established as a result of negotiating with the employer um, rather than um, seeing what jobs are already out there prior to recruitment and then just getting a job based on what is already being, out, being placed out there by employers. Individualization is pretty clear, but it's the employment relationship is always based on that individual job seeker. Um, unless that person wants to share job duties or co-own a business, everything needs to be one job for one person. The third is negotiated pay. Um, as most of you probably know, um, the person has to be at least earning minimum wage. Um, customized employment does not utilize subminimum wage. And the wages are negotiated based on a target wage that's wanted by the job seeker, um, the entry wage paid by the employer, or the typical wage paid by that position of the tasks that are being performed in the customized um, job description. The fourth essential element um, is business in the community, so, or a business owned by the individual. So it's not a human service setting um, alongside other people with disabilities. Um, it's not paid by the human service agency. It's a person working in a local community business um, that the person is actually working alongside people with and without disabilities. The fifth is mutually beneficial relationships. So again, that idea that we seek successful relationships and we focus on the benefits and needs for the employer and that the tasks we identify are aligned to the job seeker's strengths, needs, and interests. The sixth is that as job developers um, or transition teachers, we are considered um, the job development agents where we open the door. We represent the job seeker. We identify tasks and negotiate customized job descriptions. And whenever possible, the job seeker should be part of that process. Slide 19. 
there's lots of, I can, as you can see, there's lots of essential elements. <laughs> um, presumption of employment, we talked about before, which aligns really well with employment first that many states already have in place. Um, but again, it begins with the process that presumes that that job seeker has talents and skills that will benefit a, an employer, and a person does not need to be job ready in order to participate in the workforce. Um, Self-employment. So customized employment includes not only being hired by a local business, but it also includes self-employment for people who want to have their own business. Um, so what's important about that is it really needs to be a business, not a hobby. So the person has to be earning, again, a living wage. It needs to be a job that needs to be done in the community. Um, and it needs to be something where the person is actually earning something and not just doing it on the side. Slide and oh, on the bottom is the source. Um, so if you wanted to look at the document, um, that's the source that you can link to. So we'll be talking about most of these essential elements throughout the rest of the presentation. Um, slide 20. So the first step is what's called discovery or job exploration. Um, these are the essential elements, again, from that same document. Um, the, the key is to determine strengths, needs, and interests of the job seeker in a qualitative way. So traditional assessments are usually quantitative. Um, they're usually norm referenced on people without disabilities, and they really don't give us a good idea of what that person can do. Um, they do a really nice job of saying what they can't do. And we already know that people with disabilities are coming to us because they're having difficulties obtaining employment. So being able to identify what a person's skills are, what their interests are, what their passions are, is much more beneficial in helping somebody obtain employment. So using a more qualitative approach would be interviewing family members, teachers, um, people who know the person. Um, I've interviewed neighbors. I've interviewed friends of individuals just to get an idea of what they're, what they're, what they're like as a person, what their skills are, what their passions are, what their interests are. Um, observations in multiple settings. So not just having them come to your office and talk to you, but being out in the community and seeing how they are with unfamiliar places and unfamiliar people. Um, having them try different types of tasks while they're in the community. Maybe job shadowing and seeing, you know, what, what maybe lights them up as, as they're really trying to figure out what they're interested in doing. So it's really, really a qualitative approach where you're just gathering a lot of information over time. Um, and it's really ongoing. Um, it should be descriptive versus evaluative. So everything that you're writing down in the positive personal profile is simply describing the person's skills, talents, and interests. It's not evaluating and saying this is what's happening because of this. The evaluative piece isn't helpful in helping somebody find a job. So it's really just descriptive so you're keeping your opinions out of the information. It's also asset driven. So rather than focusing on what a person can't do, you're focusing on what a person can do. And certainly you can talk about deficits within, within context, but then look at how those can be turned into assets. So rather than focusing on a deficit, how can that deficit be turned into an asset? And then it's you want to spend as much time as possible and understand that the whole discovery process is an ongoing process. So a person might be job shadowing, they might have an internship next, and you're still adding to that discovery document. You're still adding to that positive personal profile to find out what they're learning and what else they might be interested in doing. So it's, it's something that is just an ever, ever, never ending process. Slide 21. So the most valuable assessment strategy really is spending time with the job seeker in a variety of settings. Um, it's not bringing them to your office and sitting down and talking to them or having them fill out a bunch of paperwork or having them do a bunch of online types of surveys or paper and pencil tasks. It's really about spending time with them and developing that relationship 
and seeing them in different environments at different times so that you can really understand what their strengths and interests and passions are. Slide 22. So building a positive personal profile, um, we have templates of positive personal profiles, but you can certainly create your own. And these are kinds of the areas that you would want to look at as you're, as you're really building a, an, an idea of what that person is like. So you want to find out what their dreams and goals are. And it's not about their dream job, because um, somebody's dream job like mine might be to uh, not work a lot and earn a lot of money. It's really about what are their interests, what are their passions, um, what are their goals in life, what do, what, are they, what do they want to do, do they want to move out. One of the examples I'll give a little later is Matthew, a young man whose dream and goal was to move out of his house because he didn't, he didn't want to work, live with his mom anymore. Um, and so we talked about how you do that and how that occurs and you need to have money to make sure that that can happen. Um, what are their talents? And some people have very hidden talents, and some people's talents are right there, and you can see them. So looking at what their talents are, what, looking at what their skills and knowledge are. Um, learning styles, how do they learn? Do they learn by listening? Do they learn by doing? Do they learn rhythmically? Do they learn by spatial? Um, not everybody learns the same way. And if you've ever heard of Howard Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences, that would be a place to start because Everybody learns differently, and his um, theory kind of gives you ideas of where you can kind of assess and see where people's learning styles are. Um, where the, what are their interests? What do they like to do when they're not doing anything, when they're not at school or they're not at home? What, what are their interests? What are their passions? What do they like? Um, I think it's really important to find out what their personality traits are, quirks included, like what kinds of weird little quirks, we all have them, what kinds of quirks do they have, because it's not only just finding what their skills are to do a job, but it's also looking at the work culture of an employer and making sure that they fit into that work culture as well. Um, my favorite example of this is a young man I worked with years ago who used profanity all the time. and. That was pretty quirky, but he would swear all the time, and it, it was just part of his vernacular. He wasn't really swearing at anybody. He was just he was just using profanity, and so I went back to our office, and of course he was on a behavior plan, and the behavior plan said that he needed to stop swearing before he could get a job, and it was two years, and. Um, Two years later, he still was using profanity, so I always had to ask myself, like, who really had the disability there? Because after two years, if he's not stopped his profanity, he's probably not going to stop swearing. He's going to continue using profanity. So I went back to the office, and we brainstormed, and we said, okay, where can you swear on a job? And you'd be surprised at the list we created of all the places that you can swear on a job. And long story short, we went to a trucking logistics company, and I took a tour. And the guy who was giving me the tour said, oh, this is, this is really great. You're going to get to see the truckers come in. You're going to get to see what they do. And I said, oh, wonderful. And as we were walking through, all the truckers were swearing up a storm. And I got all excited. And I said, oh, my gosh, do they swear like that all the time? And he said, I'm so sorry, ma'am. I said, no, this is wonderful. And I think at that point, he probably wanted to stop the tour and let me go. But I said, I have this young man who's really strong and really wants to, you know, work in the community, and this is what he does, and so long story short, they hired him, and he's still working there, and it's been like 15 years, so um, personality quirks are really important to identify. Um, temperament, you know, uh, do they have a thick skin, or do they not like constructive feedback, or do we have to consider how they're, we're giving constructive feedback to them? Um, what are their values? Um, we had a young man who was a Jehovah Witness, and so there were days that he couldn't work, and there were times that he couldn't work because he was out with the with his Jehovah Witness group. Um, so we had to understand those values. We had another woman who was um, a, a vegetarian, and so she wanted to work in the food service industry, but couldn't work where they killed animals. <laughs> so, so we had to not put her in a in a place where they had meat. Um, environmental preferences, do they like to work inside, outside, cold, warm, uh, light, lots of light, no light, 
What are their dislikes? Uh, do they have any past work experiences? Do they have a support system? Um, and then certainly, again, we want to identify any challenges. Our, you know, we want to, we know there's disabilities, we know there's going to be challenges, but putting them in context and figuring out where we might be able to support that person and what kinds of solutions and accommodations might we be able to bring in that will help with those challenges. So that's kind of the building of a positive personal profile um, to kind of help you move into that job development phase. Slide 23. Um, when you're building a positive personal profile, um, it's really important to believe in your job seeker. Um, when you're working with somebody who has a more significant disability, it's really easy to kind of fall back into this idea that they can't work or there's no employers that will hire them or to put them into a situation that is not going to be beneficial to them, but it's a business that has high turnover, so we're just going to slot them into this business. So you really have to believe in your job seeker and their skills and interests. Um, focus on the skills, not their deficits, and turn those deficits into assets. Understand that there are no prerequisites, so there's no job ready. They don't have to have worked before. They don't have to have certain skills in order to go in. Um, when people say to me, yes, but we have people who have really severe behavior problems and we've got to make sure that they behave appropriately before they go in the community, uh, you know, it strikes me that Every time I've worked with somebody who has been told that, when they're in the community, they behave the way they're supposed to behave. I think when we isolate people and we make them jump through these arbitrary hoops that the rest of us don't have to, um, that's when we get pushback from job seekers. And so it's really important to look for those rays of light and understand that people will act differently on the job. They will act differently in the community than they do sitting in your office or in school or in a segregated facility or a day service program. And then always ask yourself, what will the employer value about the job seeker? What can this job seeker bring to an employer? Slide 24. So here's an example. <clears throat> this is a young man that we worked with in Wisconsin. Um, so I would like you to meet Matthew. And here's what his file said from the school. And this is just some of the information that he had a developmental disability, that he has failed several work placements, and they just didn't think that another one would be possible. He'd have to kind of prove his worth before he could move on to another possible placement. Um, he didn't get along with children. He had behavior outbursts, but we didn't know exactly what that meant or what that looked like because, again, that's one of those arbitrary things that we don't, we're never really specific with what behavior outbursts are. Um, he moves very slowly, and he has very limited academic skills. But as we spent time with Matthew, um, and he makes a point to say it's Matthew with one T. So if anybody's looking at that saying his name is spelled wrong, it's Matthew with one T. Um, what he said um, to us and what we saw was that he was super smart. Um, he had great knowledge about all American history. Uh, he knows all of the presidents. Um, he knows all about every war, starting from the Revolutionary War to the Civil War to both World Wars, the Korean War. He could name all of the battles. He was really very outgoing and social when we had him in the community. Um, he liked to meet new people, and he'd introduce himself, and then he would ask questions about American history. It was sort of like his quiz time with new people. He liked a variety, um, and he liked learning new things. He was able to match numbers and um, use sight words, and he loved to hunt and camp. Slide 25. So thinking about what would be good jobs for Matthew and what an employer would value in him, we used this Venn diagram <clears throat> to look at our positive personal profile and we knew that he was social, we knew that he was good at matching numbers and sight words and that he loved hunting and American history. Slide 26. And there happened to be a small business in um, Milwaukee called Sherpers. And they sell everything from, um, they're like an army surplus store, but they also sell camping gear and uh, hunting equipment. 
And so we took Matthew in, and Matthew connected with the employer who's in that third picture to the far right. And he was starting to name everything and talk to him about the American history and the things that they had there and the, the war stuff. They had Vietnam War things there and World War I and World War II things. Um, Matthew was talking to him all about this, and the employer was so impressed that he said, I'd be, let's do an internship. Let's give it a try. And Matthew just recently celebrated his one-year anniversary. Um, he got a raise and additional hours. And um, because now of the work that he's doing, he's also an Employment First Ambassador. So it kind of shows how you can pull all of the things that are positives from Matthew and then build on that to, to get him at the job that he really likes. Um, slide 27. So why was Matthew successful? Because the job was matched not only based on his skills, but also his interest and his personality. That work culture, that workplace culture was exactly what he needed. He got along with all the guys there. He was able to talk to them about hunting and camping and war, everything that he liked to do. But he also had the skills to do the jobs that they needed. Um, he had attributes, and that's what we sold, and that's what he sold to the employer. Um, and he was passionate about what the business represented, so that was really important to Sherpers. And the job developer found an employment setting that was supportive. Um, the position utilized his skills and, and minimized his disabilities, and that's really what customized employment is all about. It's really finding ways to maximize an individual's skills and minimize their disabilities. Slide 28. So once you identify the positive personal profile and you have an idea of what the person's skills and passions are, the next step is looking at job development. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about the difference between job development and job placement. Customized employment is really about job development, not job placement. Job placement is looking at the opportunities that already exist in the community and then placing that job seeker in direct competition with other job seekers. So it is going and seeing the one ads that are out there, going on monster.com or going into um, Craigslist and seeing what employers are looking for and then putting a square peg into a round hole and saying, this is a job. And now, how can I put this person in this job? And that's job placement. Job development is really what customized employment is all about. Job development is about developing employment opportunities. So looking for unique skills and abilities that each job seeker has to offer, and then negotiating to shape and develop an employment opportunity um, with that local business. So it's really a more creative approach than our traditional job placement. Slide 29. So again, um, there are more essential elements um, from WinPAC and, and the sources down there again. Um, but this is um, the essential elements of the job development process um, that for customized employment. And so, of course, it's not about job placement. So we want to avoid using the job openings and typical personnel process that we use for ourselves or the way other people, because when we put people with more significant disabilities into a situation where they are competitively um, getting a job, then chances are they're not going to get that job because most job descriptions don't have our candidates in mind. Um, it's about using all of our connections and networks, and not just ours, but also the connections and networks of our candidates, their family members, teachers, neighbors, friends. So it's really looking at connections that we all have. Um, develop strategies for assisting employers to identify areas of need. So really looking at that business and saying, what's not getting done that needs to get done? Who's doing this? And how is this needing to be done? And what are some tasks that um, need to get done but are just sort of time sucks that maybe we can pull out and, and customize an opportunity for somebody? 
um, emphasizing informational relationships with employers because employers like to talk about their business. They like to talk about their industry and so getting to know employers and so after developing that relationship with your job seeker, it's just as important to develop that relationship with the local business. Customize job descriptions and then negotiate a support plan. So these are the essential elements of job development that we'll go through in a little more detail now. Slide 30. So customized employment for job development requires kind of a shift in focus. Our traditional approach to job development um, really has us seeing a limited job market because we're only looking at what's advertised. We're only looking at what's out there. We're only looking at those big box stores or those big businesses that are always looking for, for employees. But customized approaches look at possibilities everywhere and possibilities that we may not even know exist. Um, one of my stories with this is a young man that I was just walking around his community and we happened to see a sign that said St. Mary's Ultra Bread Factory. And so I asked him if he wanted to go in and he was nonverbal, but I still talked to him. And so we went in and Mitch started um, talking to or going around with the people and they were making the host wafers for churches. And it was five little old ladies in this little warehouse and it was quite an interesting process because it was like a, um, a waffle iron and then they poured the waffle stuff in and then they would come up and then you you popped them out and then you rolled them into rolls of 100. And it was really interesting and there were just five little old ladies there and as I was talking, Mitch is over trying to pour the stuff and this lady is saying, oh, don't touch it because it's too hot and then he would pop out all of the little host wafers and he'd start counting them up for them, putting them in piles of 10. And um, it was so interesting. I said, I never knew there was a job out there. This was a really an interesting, it's an interesting job. And she said, well, where did you think host wafers came from, God? And I thought, well, I kind of maybe did. I never knew anybody actually made host wafers. So seeing those possibilities everywhere is so important. In the traditional approach, we hear that we don't have any jobs open and then we move on to the next business who says we don't have any jobs open um, and then we move on to the next and then we don't have any jobs where again we hear we don't have any jobs open now. So when I go and talk to a business in a customized approach, I'm talking to them about future. I'm talking to them about what are their needs in the future and then I'm not looking for anything right now but I want to know what their business is like. What is it going to be like in three months? What's it going to be like in six months? What's it going to be like a year from now? So it's not that they don't have any jobs, it's that they don't have any jobs right now. And so I want to develop that relationship so that when they do, I'm the person that they're going to want to come and talk to. And then the traditional approach identifies jobs through existing positions, which again is job placement. And the customized approach is identifying jobs through creativity, observation, writing proposals, and developing those relationships with businesses and your job seeker. Slide 31. So networking is critical. Um, networking is not a sales call. It's about connecting and developing relationships with businesses. It's about going out into the business community. Go to where employers are. Go to your local chamber of commerce and attend the networking groups. Um, connect with businesses at a Rotary Club. Go present um, at a small business groups lunch. They're always looking for speakers. Participate, getting out there. Employers are not going to come to us. We have to go to where they are. So participating and going where they are and developing those relationships. And the first time you do that, you're probably going to be a wallflower and you're probably going to go to a business after hours for your local chamber of commerce and you're going to stand there in the corner. And that's okay. So then for your second one, you go there and you tell yourself, I'm going to bring back two employers that I've never met before and I'm going to contact and I'm going to talk to them. And then you just sort of challenge yourselves and, and, and really connect with those businesses. And once you start connecting with one, then they're going to start introducing you to others and it becomes much easier. 24-7, um, job development and networking is, is a 24-7 job. And it's everyone's job. Um, one of my former administrative assistants 
actually was a really good job developer, and she would go and connect with all of the people in her church, and she would come back with ideas for potential individuals, and here, contact this person, they're really interested. Um, when you're out in the community, look around and see what's, what's available and what's happening and what's there. And You know, if you're going into a store and you notice that everything's in disarray and then you go back and everything's still in disarray, well, that might be an employment opportunity for somebody. So go back and talk to that manager and say, hey, I shop here a lot and it seems like things are really a mess and I think we can help you with that. Networking opportunities can happen anywhere, anytime. Um, I know it sounds silly, but I've networked in the women's bathroom, I've networked in the elevator, I've networked every place. I network on planes, and I'm in planes a lot. And I sort of feel sorry for people who do sit next to me because a lot of times they'll say, so what do you do for a living? And now I have two hours to tell them what I do for a living. <laughs> and then I give them my card and I get their card, and that's, that's how you network. That's what you do. Um, networking, networking is a two-way street, so it shouldn't just be you talking nonstop. You should have an elevator speech that's really quick, short, to the point, and then you start asking that employer questions and you start talking to them. So it's really a two-way street, um, asking those good questions and be interested and then follow up with that person um, and say, you know, whenever I get a business card, I write on the back where I where I met them so that I can respond back and say, you know, I met you at the local Chamber of Commerce meeting the other night, and I'd really love to get back with you and, and uh, talk with you about what opportunities you might have as a, as a business and what needs you have. Um, it's also important to remember that our job seekers also have networks and that we need to use those networks too. And those networks may not be beneficial for that person, but they might be beneficial for another person. So ask family members, ask the job seeker, who do they know in the community? Um, one of the individuals I worked with years ago probably had a better network than I do. Everywhere we went in her community, she was known. Everybody knew who Elizabeth was. Everybody talked to Elizabeth. Everybody asked Elizabeth how her mother was and how her grandmother was. Um, and so it was really helpful to see that all these people knew Elizabeth as an individual, um, not as an individual with a disability, but just as an individual. Slide 32. Um, one way to network them once you connect with some businesses is to do informational interviews. Um, it is a way to get your foot in the door. It's the best way to get your foot in the door. So if I meet somebody at a local Chamber of Commerce event, that's the first thing I want to do is to contact them to go in and do an informational interview. It's low pressure. Um, it's a chance for me to give a good first impression and to start that working relationship. Relationship. Um, I'm going to just go in. We have informational interview forms, and there's lists of questions that you can ask. But it's basically just asking questions and finding out more about that person's business and what their needs are and what their future needs are. And as you're doing that, you're uncovering possible opportunities um, that you might be able to customize an employment opportunity for somebody. Slide 34. So make the request easy to say yes to. So this is just one example of I work with individuals interested in your industry. Would it be possible for me to come see what you do and talk about the skills needed to work in that particular industry or field so that I can better counsel the job seekers that I work with? Um, most employers are going to say yes to that because they're always going to be in need of finding new employees. And if somebody is interested now in learning about the skills that are needed, more likely they're going to say, yes, come on in so I can show you what, what my jobs are about. Slide 34. While you're doing an informational interview, um, you can see the picture of Columbo up there. I, I always show my age when I say this, but I love Columbo. He is still on TV. But anyway, he was always that guy, that detective, that would always come back and say, one more thing, one more question. And that's what we have to do when we're customizing employment opportunities and doing informational interviews. Always be on the lookout for ways that we might be able to help that business improve their workflow or looking at non-essential tasks that are really important 
important, but they really bog people down and they can't get to their other essential tasks. Um, looking at core staff who struggle to manage their workloads because they're doing a variety of other things that we might be able to pull some tasks away. Look for unhappy customers because that's definitely a possibility of being able to help a person um, kind of get their foot in the door and to help an, an employer meet an unmet need. Um, look at duties that might be performed in a different way um, but still yield the outcomes that are necessary. Or look at the degree of flexibility of the workplace or seasonal fluctuation. So these are all things you should be looking for as you're doing your informational interview so that you can pull all those pieces back along with your positive personal profile to develop a proposal to that business. Slide 35. So customized employment is employment where job tasks are reassigned from an existing job, they're restructured from one or more existing jobs, or they're created to match the skills and accommodation needs of a job seeker. And most importantly, slide 36, Customized employment approach has to help that employer's operation in some specific way. So it's really important to understand that an employer will hire anybody as long as they will bring more profit and less cost to their business. So when we go in talking about disability and can't and deficit, that's why those traditional approaches don't work. We have to go in saying we have candidates and here are their assets, here's how they can benefit their, this, your business and here's how they can impact your operation in a positive way. Um, when we look at employers, employers want to save time, they want to save money, they want to increase their customer base, and bottom line, they want to increase their profit. So if we can help them in those four ways, one of those four ways, then it will be much easier to maintain and develop a customized opportunity for somebody and maintain that relationship with that business. Slide 37. So there are seven steps to negotiating employment. So once you finish your positive personal profile and conduct your informational interview, now you're going to come back and you're going to recap the visit or the meeting that you had with that employer. And then you're going to present what you saw and you're going to say, here's how my candidate might be able to help you. Here's what I identified. These are the areas that I saw we might be able to help you improve your workflow or increase your customer satisfaction. Here's what this candidate can do. Present the benefits for that employer. Clarify our role in the process. Here's what we'll do. I'll put together a proposal. I'll show you what we'll be able to do and how this person will be able to impact your business. And then make the ask. So say to the employer, what's the next step? Um, where do we go from here? Here's my proposal. Can we bring this person in for a job interview? Can we bring them in for a hands-on job interview? Can we bring them in for an internship? And then again, reiterate the potential benefits for the employer. So following these seven steps, um, and in other presentations we go more in depth on each one, but this will really help kind of guide your way to um, customizing an employment opportunity. Slide 38. So here's an example of putting all of the pieces that I just talked about together. So Ivan is a young man that we work with um, and here are just snippets from his positive personal profile. Um, he's from Milwaukee, he's from Wisconsin, so thus he loves all sports to Wisconsin. The Brewers, the Packers, the Bucks, baseball, football, basketball, soccer, you name it, he is a sports fan. Um, he's very easy to work with. He's pretty much always happy. He's full of potential. He's very independent. He's got a great spirit. He's got a very close-knit family. When we did the person-centered planning meeting, there were 16 people, I believe, and of those 16 people, it was quite a big meeting. Um, I think 10 of them were family members. The other six were <laughs> other people. Um, he's very persistent. He has a stubborn streak. Um, he's funny. 
He likes to joke around. He's friendly. He's hardworking. Um, he never gives up. He will continue to work until he gets something done. Um, he's very smart. He's a good listener. And Ivan likes to boast that he is a champion beanbag tosser. Never know. That could come in handy when you're looking for a job. Uh, slide 38 or 9. So we did some some looking around his neighborhood and in the area, and we um, talked to Marquette University, which is in downtown Milwaukee, and it turned out that the student recreation complex definitely needed help. Um, Marquette is a very prestigious university in Milwaukee. They have a lot of alumni who have a lot of money, and the alumni and students go and play basketball on these five full-size basketball courts. And so about 2,000 students and alumni use the facility every day. And if you know anything about Wisconsin, we have snow from March till June. And it can get really sloppy and dirty and awful in those basketball courts. And the janitors constantly had to clean. No one liked to do it because they had so many other things that they needed to do. Um, that nobody wanted to do it. So we recognized that this was a possibility, that this was a need, that these basketball courts needed to be cleaned. It was a job that nobody wanted to do. And if alumni aren't happy, they're not going to give money to Marquette. So this was, our, this was our charge. Like, we can help you make sure that your alumni are happy. Slide 40. So what we did is an informational interview, and we developed a task list based on what we observed. Um, we compared the task list with Ivan's positive personal profile to look at where the match could be. We set up a working interview with Ivan, um, and then we presented an employment proposal to Marquette that said, here's, here's other things that, that Ivan would be able to do that would be beneficial um, to Marquette. And then we negotiated the terms of his employment based on what Ivan was looking for and what the needs of Marquette wanted. Slide 41. So this is, again, just snippets from our employment proposal. We have, we have um, different templates that we use for the employment proposal, but this is just kind of what we looked at. We looked at Ivan's skills. Um, we knew that he loved sports, especially Marquette, because two of his brothers actually went to Marquette, which was another way we were able to kind of talk to Marquette. Um, that he's persistent. Um, he's a hard worker. He's funny and he's easy to work with. Um, and then we looked at the task list, which was cleaning the five courts during high peak time. Um, which was Monday through Friday um, from 11 until 3, um, because apparently alumni don't work a whole lot because they're always there playing basketball. Um, we had to look at the wet mop, so we had to adapt the wet mop so that Ivan could drag, drag it behind him. Um, and then we also recognized that there were lots of extra basketballs that were left behind, and they needed to be returned to the desk. So that was something we added to the task list. So this, our employment proposal kind of looked at Ivan's skills and, and what needed to be done. Uh, slide 42. And as a result, we have the human Zamboni. Um, what we did is Ivan, um, we, it looks like it's attached to his neck, but it's really not. It's attached to the back of his wheelchair. We adapted the wet mop, so instead of pushing it, um, we, he drags it behind. And it's actually, it sounds really simple, but it's not. So he has to follow a direct route in order to get all of the floor clean. So he has to be very systematic. And if you've ever actually used an electric wheelchair, they, they don't have rack and pinion steering. So it doesn't turn on a dime. So he actually has to like really do this big circle to make sure he gets back on track. Um, and I think the favorite part of his job really is telling all the basketball players to get off that court and they have to go to another court because he has to clean the court. Um, so he, this is what he does. And now he's connected with friends. He picks up the basketballs. He, he does all of the stuff that are on his task list. But now he's also a scorekeeper for the intramural games because they love him so much there that they asked him if he would do that. So now he has this big social capital that he wouldn't have had before um, and he didn't have before. Slide 43. So things to remember. 
um, when it comes to customized employment is to always listen to your job seekers. Um, don't expect them to stay in jobs that they don't like. Um, so pay attention. See what they are interested in and what they want to do, what their passions are. Focus on skills, not their deficits. It doesn't help to look at what a person can't do. We already know they have deficits, but we have to figure out how to turn those into assets. Be strategic in approaching targeted companies based on job seekers' interests and passions and really become an expert in infiltrating that hidden job market. So that networking is so critically important. There are jobs that you have no idea are out there um, until you get out there. So when you're really looking at customized employment, you really want to make sure that you are out in the community all the time. Slide 44. Um, employers are always looking for employees, always, even during a recession, even during low unemployment, employers are always looking for employees who are interested in their business and willing to learn their business. Get to know employers and determine how you can help their company because that's really, we need to be that, that conduit between our job seeker and the business community. So how can we help that business be successful and maintain success? Um, present your candidates relevant skills and assets in a professional manner. So have a professional resume or have a, uh, you know, we started using um, uh, business cards where people will have their pictures and then they'll say looking for a position in and then whatever it might be or using visual resumes. Um, all of those things are important. Slide 45. Oh, this is the, there it is. Okay, that's the end. I thought I had a better, a better closing. I guess I don't. Um, <laughs> so here is your certificate of participation code, um, meaningful work. And uh, as Maynard said earlier, to request a certificate of participation, you have to include the code no later than 12 p.m. Eastern, Friday, December 1st, which is tomorrow. So meaningful work is the participation code. Thank you um, for your attention to this webinar. Um, Transcend, again, offers web-based and in-person training for state agencies, school districts, provider organizations, and others um, who, based on our work supporting individuals with disabilities. And this is our, our mission, meaningful work and community inclusion. So thank you very much, and much success to everybody in customizing employment. So I think we have some questions. Uh, the first question is, where can we find the forms for informal interviews? Informational interviews? Um, so I think they're on our website at transcend.org. Um, if not, you can email me and I will send them to you. And my email is lowens at transcend.org. All right. The second question is, what, are, what were Matthew's negotiated duties based upon his skills and interests? So Matthew is responsible for um, organizing all of the, um, the, the, I hate to say war material, but that's what it is. So all of the historical um, war material from the Vietnam War, the Korean War, World War II, I think is primarily where they have. So, and then he answers questions as customers come in. If they are asking for something specific uh, to the Vietnam War, he will steer them in that direction. Um, and then he also is doing the um, camping and hunting now. So in Wisconsin, we're big hunters and campers. And so he uh, stocks and um, answers questions of customers as they're, as they're coming through the store. The next question is, what level of qualifications or training do job developers have? Um, I'm, that's a good question. I'm not sure. It, I think it depends on your organization. Um, I think the more training job developers can have, the better success they will have. Um, sometimes, personally, I don't often hire people who have a background in rehabilitation because then you have to relearn some of this stuff. Um, sometimes people coming back with business backgrounds are, are 
are, are good job developers because they have a better understanding of business needs. Um, but I think it just depends on your organization or your state. Right now there are no real qualifications that you have to have. I know that APSI has a CESP, a Certified Employment Support Professional certification. Um, and I know some states and some organizations um, are requiring that for their job developers. We are getting the question of where do people email for their uh, certificate of participation. The email is inquiries at transcend.org. Again, inquiries at transcend.org. And you can submit your questions uh, within the chat feature uh, located on the bottom right hand side. You can enter your questions. And Laura, there's a question for you. What is your email address? It's L Owens, L O W E N S, at T R A N S C E N dot org. Okay. And there's also a question of what the participation code was. We are moving back to uh, this slide uh, showing it. And that code again is meaningful work. And you must email us at inquiries at transcend.org. Okay, thank you very much for your attendance. Again, if you have any questions, please go to our website or feel free to email me at lowens.transcend.org. And good luck to everybody.